Welcome to the Chasing Freedom Show. I'm Noah Evans, and on this show, I'm going to creatively break down real estate deals with top investors across the country to help you become closer to achieving financial freedom. Alrighty, let's get to it. All right, guys, welcome back to the Chasing Freedom Show. Today, I've got an awesome investor with us, Aaron Beal out of San Antonio, Texas, and he's going to drop some knowledge on you guys today. So pull out your pens, notebooks, and pay attention to this episode. All right, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, nice meeting you, I guess, as of uh, five, 10 minutes ago. Absolutely, bro. Yeah, no, I'm excited, man. I know we have some mutual friends and stuff, so it's uh, it's good to connect with you. It is. And I've been watching your content and it it you make real estate understandable to the average person. And I'm not, I'm not anything above average. So it's like, I've, I've enjoyed watching your journey, the houses you're taking down, your flips, all of it's been really fun, man. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know that it's super polished, but my thing is just really trying to be honest, be real. Yeah, absolutely. On. Um, and most of the time it's like, dude, it's, it's rough. It's, I'm not good at it. Like, so it's like, I need something I've uh, kind of had on the list to work on of, you know, really hiring that out, figuring out how to, standardize this because my thing is I'll, I'll post something I think about it and then, you know, we're wrapped up in a bunch of other stuff. And I realized I didn't haven't posted anything and other than, you know, random stories here and there and, you know, a week or two. So yeah, it's something, uh, something on my list to, you know, add at some point. No, I'm in the same boat. Uh, and it's, it's like hard because it's like, there's a part of your content that's super relatable because it's, it's just you with your phone. Right. Exactly. But then there's the other side of it where it's like, well, what if I did like professional quality content at scale and had like a scheduled number of posts and people could expect on Mondays, I do a deal deep dive on Tuesdays. I do something about my family, I, you know, like th- there's two sides to it. Um, and it's hard to say what's right or wrong, but it's also hard to build that team because it's expensive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's like, it's like any hire, like you can't really afford them when you need them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. I'm sure we've both seen people that have like exploded just through, you know, what they're posting, you know, doing YouTube stuff or podcasts or Instagram, TikTok, whatever. And then um, you kind of start to look around and you're like, these people aren't doing any like that much more than me or anything that different. It's just, they're talking about it. Yeah. Um, They're showing people what they're doing and, and that where I, I get caught up in deals we're focused on and like, don't, don't talk about it. Or I, I record a video and never post it. And yeah. Like, I've got so and many. This is like, <laughs> now this is like three months old. And I'm like, I sold the house. Go. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not fresh anymore. Like, all right. Like don't record an intro. I don't know. I'm all over the place. As you can tell. No, oh, I feel you there, man. Yeah. It's, 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 it's something I, I, I'm trying to focus on it more because I feel like in the next five years, social media will become a currency. And so, like, I just really think like the influence that you have there is power because you can hire better people. You'll get more access to deal flow, more access to capital. Um, you'll have a, a further reach. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I just feel like if you're not focusing on it right now, you're going to be left behind in the next four or five years. When you need it, you can't really afford it. I mean, that's like every hire, but yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, saw someone there, I was like, I think I can hire someone full time now. Like I can afford it, but like, I don't know. Like, what does that cost? I don't mean, like, What's a videographer cost? What's a, all this stuff cost? 40, 50 grand? Like, yeah. I just need someone to like say, Hey, show up here and let's do this. Like, I'll give you my ideas and you know, we can keep it like my personality, but like, I don't have the time to like plan it all out. No, oh, yeah. And then and that's the problem. So actually one of my buddies owns a big, like full, like media company that does stuff yeah. at scale. And so we're actually like trying to figure out like how do we incorporate like what we have back into that? And then how can we offer that as a product to other real estate people? Um, cause I think it'd be super helpful, but there's always one thing that ruins the ability to, to do that at scale. And that's that. Yes. All the editing, all the posting that could be done from anywhere in the world. The yeah, problem is, local person? is that you need the local person that's going to film the content for you. Um, yep. and so I, I feel like there's gotta be an easy way to do it. Like reverse search people posting awesome content on Instagram, but do it like yeah. in the San Antonio area. Right. And you're like, Oh look, yeah. I'd hire that person. If they could just film the content for you, you can upload it to the portal with my buddy's company. They edit it and create you all the content you need and then blast it out. But then there's a whole nother part of it. Like editing and blasting the content out is just like one step. 
The second part of that is doing it the right way. It's like the right keyword research. It's the right video topics. It's got to be high quality. Oh, sure. Sound quality has got to be good. Yeah, there's just there's so much that goes into it. Um, yeah, uh, like I forget what Travis and I, Travis is the guy helping me film the podcast. I forget what we were talking yeah. about yesterday, how we were going to do it. I think what we were going, what we were planning on doing is if Travis can film everything for me and he does a good job at it, but we need a creative, yeah. like a creative writer who can write the scripts and go watch all the TikTok videos and all the well-performing oh, yeah. Instagram videos. And I need someone to just hand me a script, right? And say, Hey, Noah, if you do these six videos today, uh, you know, we're going to be good. That'll be enough content for the next like 25 days. Cause they can break it apart and rip it up and repurpose it and get it me posted. I think exactly. that's, that's what we need. And that's the part we're missing. So if you guys are listening to the show, me and Aaron are both looking for social media people. I need a creative writer, a uh, creative writer. Uh, Aaron, what do you need? Dude, I need freaking everyone. Yeah, no, okay, need, everyone. So <laughs> I don't know what I need. Be right? careful That's what you wish for, like, man. You'll have people knocking on your door. <laughs> I know. I see the uh, I see the opportunity, but it's like I don't even know what I'm looking for. I don't even know it well enough to to know how to even ask. Well, I guess this is a good interactive part of the show. So, like, if you guys are listening and you're struggling with social media, um, if I was able to bring that part to where like we could edit and post and schedule and write the content for you, you know, would that be helpful? I'd, I'd love to hear from the listeners. I'm sure Aaron would love to, to be connected to people that have the ability to do that as well. So, um, yeah, there you for go. Sure. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think it's easy to be like, ham hey, too late. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, so I was at an event, uh, Ryan Pineda's event, I don't know, a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm, honestly the biggest thing I took away from him and I talked to, you know, Chandler David Smith a little bit, who's, you know, big in the YouTube world. It's like, they've only been doing it a year or two or two and a half years or whatever. So it's like, it didn't take too long to build, you know, this machine of a following. So I think it's one of those, like any YouTube, as you like hear, or listen to, it's like, Oh, I, I always felt like I got in too late. And it's like, well, now you have 3 million subscribers. Like, but uh, I think that's the the rub too. I'm like, well, there's already too many people like right. at this point, like, you know, we're too late to the game. Um, but it's really not. I mean, a lot of it's probably still the very beginning. I, I agree completely. I think we haven't even seen what the power of it's going to be, especially with all these other new things coming out, like, you know, all the crypto coins and NFTs. It, it's all, I think it's all going to become so connected. You know, it's like, if you look back 10 years ago, would we have ever imagined Facebook and Instagram would be what it was and that it would consume so much of people's lives and it's how we would shop and it's how we would stay connected with family right. members? Like, I, or then like, you know, something new like TikTok that's like, you know, you would never think like, you know, Facebook or Instagram or any of those would ever give up any sort of like market share. And then you have like Snapchat comes in, kind of fades away. And then you have like TikTok. I don't know. It's like, there's going to be something else. Like who knows what it is. Right. I agree. I'm not in space. I don't know anything like that. No. But, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's there's above, going to be more, right? It's above my pay grade for sure. Well, dude, let's transition into like the why of like why you got into real estate. Like what pushed you into this, you know, industry, um, and then I'd love to go into like a deal deep dive after that and like, and talk about the specifics of like what you do in real estate. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I feel like my story is similar in a lot of ways to, you know, several people of, I started listening to bigger pockets mm -hmm. and then, you know, you slowly kind of become obsessed with that. And, uh, I, that kind of coinciding with, uh, I had a corporate job. I worked in oil and gas. That's my, you know, educational background. Mm -hmm. Uh, moved, actually moved from Ohio to Texas for you no know, full-time job after um, grad school. So uh, it was kind of like finding bigger pockets, learning about real estate, and then coinciding with not liking my job and things getting progressively worse there. And um, some of that, you know, is, you know, job stuff. And I'm sure some of that's me and not being a very good employee and not, not employable, honestly, like I can't work with people. Um, I'm in the same. I've been fired from probably, I mean, I was good at the sales jobs, but I've still been fired from most of my jobs. So I resonate with that. Well, I've never been fired. Well, I was really close this last time. <laughs> I it, and it was kind of a surprise, but uh, I was always that, you know, employee comes in, like really works hard. Like, and then they're like, Oh, here's your 3% raise. Um, so the kind of that whole, like, and I was just getting burned out on that. And like, there's got it. Like, I want something where I can like eat what I kill. You yeah. Know, that's the job. And then uh, that kind of coinciding with finding stuff about real estate. Cause I always had this idea. It was funny. Like, I feel like I have like, ideas in my head and then I realized they're not my own. Like, oh, I could just buy a house every year and like 
if it pays for itself, like I'll eventually have 10 houses. And then you realize that's really bad criteria to base. <laughs> it's like, well, it almost covers the mortgage. And you're like, that's probably not good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, probably a few years of, you know, I mean, I probably listened to every Bigger Pockets episode in the first year of finding mm-hmm. it. And then, you know, I was, but it's hard to focus and like, oh, this person does this texting thing and this person, you know, does like nursing home or like whatever, right? There's, you know, it's always this highlight reel type, you know, stories, which are awesome, but like, you never really know like what things actually look like. So then, um, you know, eventually like had four or five rentals, had some Airbnbs, quit my job and thought I was ready for that. And then I wasn't, but uh, (laughs) What, what do you mean? What do you mean you weren't? What happened? Well, I just like, so I like now I'm doing, you know, all like off market deals, you know, direct to seller marketing, all of that. Like, I didn't even know that existed other than like, I sent some letters one time and like, so this is a story I don't think I've ever told actually. So like, cause I would just hear stuff on bigger pockets and like, oh, I need lead Sherpa, right? Like, and then you like, don't realize that like, if people respond to stuff, then you got to like deal with it. Like you got to know like what to buy something for or like how to talk to people or like all these things. Right. So I would like listen to something and be like, okay, I'm going to mail these people. So I like came up with this, like I mailed this pro wait list, which is like nothing you ever want to mail. And then I like read this thing. It's like, Oh yeah, put a penny in it. So then it's like heavier and they open it. And it was like, I just got like the meanest responses ever, which I mean, I get it. Like one lady's like, I don't know why you sent me this penny. It was like pissed. And I'm like to this day, like embarrassed about like, that so I kind of dabbled in some of that stuff and then like I was like hey I'll get my real estate license I'll you know figure out the retail stuff as I'm figuring out the investor side of stuff and then um thought I was ready to quit my job and then was like okay well now I guess I'm doing this real estate thing like what does that look like and you know took a while to figure it out but now things are a little better yeah yeah I think that that leap is hard and I think there's certain things you can do to set yourself up to make that leap more successful. And one of the things I like you said is you already had some properties. Um, it doesn't matter if they only cash flow 50 bucks a month. You still had some properties. You still had some income coming in. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think there's probably like three important things I would say people should focus on when making that leap from quitting your job or moving from a space where you have guaranteed income to moving to a space where your uh, your income is based on your performance or eating what you kill, as you explained. Yeah. And I like that analogy. The first I would say is set your fin- financial like foundation up, right? So if you have an expensive car payment, you don't need to drive, you know, a $70,000 car, especially when you're trying to make that leap. So yeah, go so along th- those lines too. Like I, uh, I moved out of my primary residence uh-huh. Airbnb and rent a room. For oh, my that's friend. so smart. Yeah. Like, you know, so my, like, I didn't have a car payment. My monthly, you know, rent was like 500 bucks. And I'm like, exactly. Okay. Like I maybe don't know what I'm doing, but I, like, I'm not going to, like, be homeless. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. So, like, for me, like, I had two old cars. We just chose not to get new vehicles, and I had them yep. paid off. So, I had no car payments. And then, uh, so that would be the first thing. I said, I'd, I would eliminate luxury expenses. Step one, get your financial, you know, foundation kind of a little bit more stable. Number two, I'd figure out what your own living situation is, and I'd try to house hack. That would be my first uh-huh. deal for sure. Like like you said, you you Airbnb'd your, th- your uh, house. I took a single family home and split it into two levels, rented out my basement for 1400 bucks a month. My mortgage nice. was 12. So now I have no car payments yeah. and no mortgage. Yeah. I get to take a lot more risk all of a sudden and it's not so scary. Right. Yeah. And when I sure. quit, when I quit my job and bought that house, I put pretty much everything I had into it and had maybe five grand left to my name. Um, and I, it took me like 30 days to land my first deal. Like, I mean, I was already doing deals, but it took me 30 days to get a deal after quitting my job. And then I didn't really, I kept reinvesting the money. So I didn't really make money again for like another like six months. And then all of a sudden it just like skyrocketed. But it, that's like momentum, you know, the compound effect, sure. that book uh, written by, what is it? Darren Hardy talks about Big Mo. Um, and yeah, yeah it, it comes swinging when you just stay yeah. in it long enough, you know, so. Yeah. No, I really like that. And that's one of the things I tell people a lot. I'm like, you start to like, the longer you're in this business, you start to see the benefits of being in it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like I have a, a deal we we'll hopefully have on Friday. And it's like, you know, we first talked to her a year ago. So it's like, if, you know, if you quit six months in, like you, you don't get those compound effects of like, Hey, like our marketing is cumulative and 
you know, you get referrals and all these things that like, it's not, it's like easy at this point. It just, you start to have some of these things drop that you're like, Oh, that was something I spent money on a year Mm -hmm. ago. Now it's, you know, paying off. And, you know, if you quit or burn out or, you know, decide you want to do something else too early, it's like, you're going to miss some of that. Cause a lot of these deals, I mean, you guys know that you don't get laydowns on everything. No. A lot of it's, you know, you're following up over time or, you know, something, the situation changes. And, but if you're, if you're not in the game long enough, you don't, you don't ever realize that. Yeah. So let's talk about, I want to hear a little bit more about that transition. So you had a couple rentals. What did you have? You had like a, a couple multifamily properties or what were they before you quit? Uh, so they were all single families. Um, shoot. I, I think I'd like three Airbnbs. Okay. How did you get uh, financing on that? Like what, what, how did you find those properties? Yeah. So that was all stuff that like with my previous job, I had, you know, had financing. So you used your W2 income. W2, um, 20% then, down. Uh, and it was 20% down. I bought, I bought a rental. It was uh, a single family house with a back house that I, you know, bought with some friends because it seemed like a good idea to partner with friends and now we're selling it and it's, it's fine. Like it, it was one of those like, Hey, this works. It's kind of a proof of concept, but, uh, you know, it was more me just being like, well, I don't want all the risk. So how about you guys throw in some money? And then they don't have the passion for real estate. I do. So, you know, it's just kind of one of those yeah, whatever, yeah. kind of partnerships, but um, I don't think there's anything fine. wrong with it was, that, you know, yeah. going to partner with friends. It, it does alleviate the stress. And I think a lot of times it's just scary to make the jump. And so, um, yeah, I mean, my first flip, my very first flip ever, I, I just brought the money for the rehab someone else did the whole flip and I got a partner in yeah. it. and it, it, yeah. it gave me confidence for my next one. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of, so when I started, I, um, I worked with this small brokerage that was kind of investor minded. So we did, I did some retail stuff, which found out I really hate on the, uh, retail realtor side. And then, um, you know, worked with this broker that, you know, they did off market deals, they did flips. So a lot of that, when I started with him, it was like, there's no sort of marketing. It was just kind of like, Hey, find a deal. Like we'll take care of everything and we'll give you half of it, which is like great getting started. Like I had a lender, I found a title company, like learned a ton. And I was there probably six to eight months. And each deal I did was like a little more. And it was like, you know, I was just finding random stuff, like no marketing, just like, Oh, I heard you can get a cold collar. Like got a deal from a random cold collar, like bought some stuff from wholesalers, whatever. But it was this, uh, for me, it was, you know, like, yeah, I gave away half and eventually you're like, I don't need to do that. But you learn, like I have a lender who I still work with on a ton of deals. I have a title company that I run everything through and, um, you know, just different connections like that, where you can kind of see people doing it, where it's like, eventually I was like, I'm not giving away everything, right. half, whatever, but like, I'm not like, I didn't leave on bad terms. Like I was just like, Hey, it's time for me to like, jump out of the nest. And Time for me to grow them. up. Yep. Exactly. So how did you find the lender? How did you find the title company? What did you do to go find those people that are uh, maybe a little bit more investor savvy and willing to work with you? Honestly, I, I didn't do anything. It was through the broker that I worked with who was an investor and it's kind of like, Hey, this is who we use. Like we have this hard money guy that we have a partnership with. And then, you know, this is the title company we use. They know how to deal with investors and messy title issues. And, I mean, so the first thing I ever contracted to this day has not closed. And it was like, there were like 30, 40 errors on this like cheap house. But it's like, you know, I was like taking on paperwork and I was like sitting in this 86 year old man's house, like two times a week. And like, just like in learning there. Yeah. yeah. Right. But as far as, you know, like some of those resources, it was like, I jumped in and like had access to those. And I had people to like, look at a deal and be like, Hey, this is a deal or it's not, or like, this is how you run comps. Yeah. Like this, yeah. How you calculate repairs. So, I mean, I learned a ton. It was just, uh, for me, it was trying to figure out how to consistently have deal flow. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, cause there was always this, um, this world of these like direct to seller deals that everyone wanted and no one knew, how, like no one knew how to get. So from there, I kind of, uh, you know, decided, Hey, I'm going to try to figure this out on my own. Um, get plugged in with people who know how to do that and join Ryan Dossie's group and, you know, I've been in several groups since then on, you know, people with marketing stuff and, you know, people that do direct to seller because 
you know, it's the world everyone wants to be in and yeah. how to get there. Yeah, I like that, man. And I want to unpack something you just said there because it's a reoccurring theme among probably all of my guests. You're going to pay either way. No matter what, you're going to pay to be in this game. You're either going to pay because you're smart and you bought like a course and yep. someone accelerated that that, 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 that pain for you, the, the, you know, draws the connections and lays out a little bit of a roadmap. Or are you going to pay through giving up portions of your deals for mentorship, which is exactly what I did. You just explained to me that's what you did. Um, yep. I did an Instagram post like six weeks ago, totally unrelated field. But one of my buddies has done really well in like construction, which is kind of related and solar. And same thing, okay. he gave up a bunch of his deals by going to work for somebody else first and figuring it out and, and accelerating their growth. Like you didn't have to then go lose a deal because a title company messed it up and accidentally disclosed what the assignment fee was to the buyer. I have, Yeah. right? <laughs> I had a mentor and yep. I still have gone through that. Uh, yep. You know, you didn't have to go- uh, One of the reasons I just don't assign anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, there's just so many mistakes that you quickly bypassed and you're like, you almost like just went around the mountain instead of having to go up and over it because you went and worked with a mentor first. And yes, they may have taken half your deals, but wouldn't you have rather had those deals than no deals? Yeah. And for me, it's, it's still like a, like a proof of concept thing. Like, Absolutely. Hey, I did this. Like we bought this for 90 and sold it for 130. Mm -hmm. Like this is real. Like, it's not just like, I see other people do it. Mm -hmm. Like, and then you do my, my last one I did there. I think we made like 53 grand on. And I was just like, yeah, I think, I think I'm out. Yeah. Like, so, you know, uh, I don't think I need this. So you primarily fix and flip, right? Uh, so a little bit of everything. I, honestly, I probably mainly, you know, wholesale. Um, right now, I mean, the focus is keeping everything as rentals that I can afford to keep. Yep. Um, you know, cause, cause sometimes this business is just a grind. Like I enjoy it a lot of times and there's days where I'm like, I don't want to have to buy a house today or this week or this month. Um, so a lot of focus on building up a portfolio. So like, if one day I'm just done with this, like shut it down, you know? So, um, what's that, yeah, goal? what's that goal look like? Like what number do you need to get to, to be like, I don't need to do this anymore. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that I have one of those. So right now I probably have like 20 rentals. Mm -hmm. Um, I could probably live off of it, you know, Easy. Yeah. I could, I could sell stuff. It'd be fine. But for me, like it's, it doesn't feel like work. Like, I love this stuff. I love talking to people. I love meeting sellers and, you know, figuring out some stuff with deals. Uh, and then, you know, but then I like deal with contractors or whatever. And I'm like, I'm never doing this again. So yeah, to get back to your original question. Uh, so we buy rentals, we do some fix and flips. Um, I don't do major rehabs. Uh, so mainly we buy newer houses, carpet and paint type stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, we sell some land, buy quite a few mobile homes really kind of thing. Yeah. Some small multifamily, um, kind of all over the place. I like it, man. And I, I, I think that, uh, for anyone listening, it's like, you didn't start with doing everything right. So it's like, I, I do recommend people pick a very specific niche and go deep for a little bit. And then what you'll find is once you get some of those systems and processes set up, you can just funnel other things kind of naturally into the whole process. Yeah. So yeah. don't, I wouldn't yes. force that at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, so our thing is, uh, so I have a business partner now who just kind of linked up this, this year I was kind of doing my own thing before that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, our thing is like, not that we want to do more deals necessarily, but just like, how do we maximize it? So I don't like wholesaling one. I feel like you leave money on the table. It doesn't really support the way I like running a business of building a good reputation. It's just this weird dance of, who am I talking to? Are they going to find out that these people exist? Like, I mean, I do it. I just don't really like it. So, yeah. you know, we, we take down almost everything and then it's just a matter of, you know, how do we maximize this? Like, you know, do we do a full flip? Do we have the capacity to do that? Do we just clean it out and list it? Do we mm -hmm. enlist it and just kind of, um, you know, see what we can do there. And then when we wholesale stuff, it's normally like, Hey, pay this price or I'm going to take it down and list it. Like, I don't like, I don't like care that much. Yeah. Right? It's like, I'm going to make what I need to make or I'll, I'll do it another way. So well, let's, probably, let's go deep on wholetailing. Like what, what's wholetailing? How do you determine something's going to be a successful wholetail? Do you ever have concerns that like you're missing 
you're missing, uh, not necessarily on profit, but you're missing on things that you didn't know were wrong. And you're going to have to now go spend more money to just go do that. And it's like, at that point, should you have just rehabbed it? Like walk me through this process and then, then let's dive into a deal. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so pretty much every deal we look at, we're going to look at it as, you know, we're going to look at as is comps. We're going to see what the as is value is. And then we're going to also evaluate it from, Hey, if we repair this and do, uh, you know, moderate rehab, what's that, what's that value going to look like? And then we're going to compare those two numbers. We're going to see which one allows us to pay more, honestly. And then if there's any sort of like tie or anything, we're always going to go to assets. Like there's no rehab. You're not even, yeah, there's no rehab. There's no risk. There's less money involved. And it's that, you know, that's always going to be the default. If it's like, Hey, you could spend 30 grand and make 40 or you could, you know, whatever. Like if those numbers are close, we're going as is. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't ever do full inspections. Um, and I mean, I've like, I sold stuff on the market that shouldn't have sold. Yeah. I mean, you just like, people are like, are you, you, we lost you. Um, it's kind of a thing. We, uh, we lost you at, uh, I've sold okay. stuff on the market that, and then it cut. Okay. Yes. I mean, so I've sold stuff on the market that, you know, I've, I've had people tell me like, there's no, there's no way you're actually going to list this. Right. And I'm like, yeah. And you know, the showing instruction will be like, just walk in, there's no door like, or just open the door. Cause it's not locked or whatever, but like, you can really sell anything. Um, well, you just don't know who is out there looking like ultimately the MLS is the best buyers list you can ever have because it's full oh, of for sure. agents for sure. hungry to earn a commission and like, they're going to go out there. It's like having a bunch of little dispo managers. Yeah. And I think the last year or two has spoiled us with the lack of inventory and how crazy the market's been. But like the thing you don't realize when you wholesale something, like you were saying, you have this whole new buyers list, but you have not only investors, you have the people that are like, I get a 5% discount for this like fixer upper. And I get to like, you know, be like Chip and Joanna and make it look the way I want. <laughs> and they're like pumped about like a five or 10% discount where I'm like, I just sold this at 90% when like an investor won't buy it. So um, it really depends, but especially like we buy a lot of cleaner houses. Like we closed on one last week that's 10 years old and it looked like bought it from the original owner. It looks brand new. Yeah. Like, yeah. That stuff's easy and will e easily be financeable. So yeah, it just kind of, it just kind of depends, but like, you know, we kind of just uh, buy, like when we make offers, it's assuming we're going to take it down and, you know, calculating some of that. So, you know, we, we kind of wholesale anything, anything we can, we can, you know, if we can move it quicker and get in and out, that's fine. But if not, we'll wait two, three months and make more money on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's unfortunate because uh, we've done a couple hotels, but it was, I haven't done a hotel in maybe eight months or so now. And same thing, yeah. like I was shocked with some of these ones we were able to um, sell. Um, yeah. And it was really just a result of like we had taken down two homes and in that time frame, we weren't going to be able to start the rehab on them for like another four weeks. So we basically yeah. just came to the conclusion. We're like, dude, let's just list it. And if it sells, it sells. Who cares? Like <laughs> we're, we can't start this rehab for another 30 days anyways. So it doesn't make yeah. a difference. And they both sold like that. And I was like, oh, that was crazy. Um, and you know, it's funny is uh, we just missed out on a deal because I – and we're changing our rehab spreadsheet now, our, our deal analyzer spreadsheet right now okay. to incorporate uh, a hotel option because you brought yep. up something that I really wanted to share. Your flip price is not the same as your hotel price. They are different prices that you can pay. Yeah. They're different purchase prices. So um, yeah, often, especially if you don't have to go in and finance a $50,000 rehab and have that yeah. holding cost for six months, uh, you can often pay more, but I think the yeah. thing for people to remember is that's not on full gut houses. That's on houses that like, you know, they, they need some work. They're, they're outdated. There's but it some, can be though. Like, could. Yeah, it could. <laughs> no, it's like, I think you, uh, I think you might need to clarify the difference between wholesaling and wholetailing for oh, listeners good. at home. I don't know if we've ever discussed this on the show before. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks Travis. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I mean, uh, Aaron, what, what, what's the difference between wholesaling and wholetailing? Yeah, for sure. Good question. So Wholesaling is, you know, essentially, you know, you, you know, bought a house, you contract a house for 70 grand. You have someone who wants to buy it for 80 grand. You work out some paperwork to, 
you know, you got it for 70, they get it for 80, you make the difference, right? You never own the thing, mm -hmm. either you assign the contract or, um, I mean, kind of depending on state and rules and stuff, you may double close it, but you're, you're essentially not taking ownership of it, not taking the risk. Um, you found a product, you know, you got a good deal, someone else wants it, they buy it. Um, wholetailing is when you're actually purchasing the property, taking it down, um, you know, getting a loan on it, paying cash, whatever, taking title to it. And then um, I think on wholesaling, people kind of have varying ranges of like, it's a light flip or, you know, it's cleaned out or whatever. But for me, it's, it's normally just like get the trash out of it and list it. Mm -hmm. um, but like actually taking ownership of it and reselling it. Yeah. What are your, what, what type of financing are you generally using to do these wholesales? Are you using a hard money lender? We have a hard money lender um, who will lend on hundred up to hundred percent. So most he's more expensive than I would like him to be, but uh, you know, I can take on multiple projects uh, with nothing out of pocket. Like what does he, up, what does he up, charge you? Oh man, this hurts. Uh, 12 and three, 12, so 12 and three, 12% yeah. three points. Um, but he does a hundred percent. So for me, yes, it's easy. It's convenient. Right. It's expensive. Um, but I look at it as like a cost, like, Hey, this is still, I'm going to make more than wholesaling it. So that's how I've approached it. Not probably the best idea, like need more private money, um, you know, better rates and stuff, yeah. but it allows, you know, allows us to do business, allows us to take on multiple projects and right. Well, you know, and we well, and things there, are good. You know? There is a price there, there, there is a, people need to factor in their time, right? And so for, for you, not having to go raise that private money means it's one less conversation you have to have. It's one yeah. less uh, financial, it's actually multiple financial documents that get eliminated from the process. You no longer have to do a promissory note. You don't have to secure that to the property. You don't have to do a deed of trust. Way less communication. Um, it's yeah. one person. You're like, hey, we're buying the house for this. You're gonna do 100% of financing. Okay, cool, good, we're done. Yeah, and it's one of those, yeah, you're exactly right there. And and it's so convenient now because it's like they don't do appraisals. He doesn't even do BPOs on my stuff because I've done 50, 60 deals with them. So it's like, and I, I could be like, call him tomorrow. Like, hey, we're closing on, on this in three days. And he's like, okay, like as long as it's nothing like crazy, like, you know, I have money. And there's a lot of value in that pocket. Yeah. So it just depends. Uh, you know, of course, I would rather have cheaper private money, which I'm working on, but, uh, for now, it you know allows me to, you know, do business. And right. It's just super convenient. That's uh, like yeah. The biggest thing. Like he works with my title company. They know where to send stuff. Like my insurance knows who bought who to put on insurance. So it's just for me, it's just an easy button. And uh, you know, sometimes we source other stuff, and then sometimes we're like, "Hey, dude, can I have two hundred grand tomorrow?" And he says yes, and keeps saying yes. So yeah, yeah. There's a there's so much value in that. That's huge. Um. Let's let's dive deep into a hotel uh, deal. Um, do you have a specific deal you want to share? For sure. Uh, actually, it's one of my favorite deals. So, um, which kind of leads to other deals. So I'll try to make it quick, okay. but also with a decent detail. So this was uh, kind of in the beginning of of COVID when this happened, and uh, it was the point when all the i buyers got scared and pulled. Right. So. Um, this guy Googles me, finds me, uh, you know, Google ad and, you know, reaches out. They just really cool, like amazing mid-century house. It's super dated, but really well kept. Um, he wants like, I don't know, 200 grand, 250, oh, um, something. And I'm at like, I just pretty much told him, Hey, like this is never going to work. I need to be at like 150 or 160. Um, like don't hear from the guy for months. He eventually calls me back and kind of the unique situation of that, like I literally tried to find friends to buy this place. Cause I'm like, it's cool. Um, you know, so I kind of was like, Hey, let me see if I can find anyone that can pay you more. Like I can't help you, but maybe someone else can I'd yeah. love to help you move. Right. So, and then his, his wife actually had, um, some sort of like immunodeficiency. So it's like, couldn't see the house. They didn't want to let anyone in, you know, all of that with this, when COVID was brand new and no one knew what to expect. So, uh, he eventually calls me back and he's just like, Hey, we're good to go. Like, um, and I end up paying, I think 165 for it. 
uh, I was trying to assign it to all these people for like 180. No one would take it. I couldn't get showings. I went with one contractor, his buyer bailed. Um, so end up taking it down for 165. Uh, we let them move out, like give them a week to move out, whatever. Um, clean it out, change the light bulbs to make it brighter. So actually this one I partnered with that same hard money lender on. So nice. we went 50, 50. He didn't think it was a deal, but was like, Hey, like we'll give it a try. We list it, you know, get it cleaned out. We did one drywall repair, um, change the light bulbs, but it had like, I mean, it needed rewired. It had like a federal Pacific panel, like all these things that like, you know, people would be like, you need to redo all this. And we just, you know, brightened it up and got professional pictures and, Listed it for I think two forty five, and had multiple offers and took a full price offer and, you know I think each of us made end up making like fifty or no like twenty five thirty on it, when I was trying to assign it for fifteen and couldn't get anyone to take it, so, um, really led to him telling his coworker who kind of had a um, similar situation, um, had this house that needed work, really nice area, another really cool mid-century house. So I eventually bought his coworker's house, which I assigned, I double closed for $40,000 to, um, you know, this flipper who found mm -hmm. me on Facebook or Instagram, who's now my business partner. Cause you know, like it was a good situation. Hey, right there. Isn't that proof that like, Social media is worth it. Right. <laughs> yeah, so like, so I had this deal and I was like, it was one of those times I was like, I really want to sign this. Yeah. Like, it was a, it was a big flip. Like it needed a full. Yeah. You didn't want to do that. Yeah. And it's like at the time buying a house for two fifteen or two twenty or whatever was like, I'd never bought a house for that. So that was scary. Yeah. I feel you there. And then like, I'd actually comment on someone else's post and you know, this guy reached out to me and, and it, so the biggest thing with him and kind of how we, I, I guess, became friends and then business partners is there was a pretty bad, like plumbing foundation issue, whatever. Right. The, we have a lot about bad foundations in San Antonio, but so this house was on a slab. It had like a plumbing leak that was like bubbling up through the slab in the living room. Um, so I pretty much like, we were kind of going back and forth on sales price with, um, my buddy Jason, who I eventually sold it to and now partner with. Um, and we were like five grand off. And I just said, Hey, listen, like you can see the house once, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, if you feel like the plumbing situation was worse than you thought it was like, just give me a call. I'll give you five grand. Like we're fighting over five grand. I don't care. Like, you know, if, if you feel like I screwed you over in the future, like you have my number, call me, like I'm not hiding. Um, which he never did. And we agreed on a price. And I was brave and, of you to do that. Cause my assumption would be like, even if nothing went wrong, this person's going to call me and ask for five grand. But so that's the thing. So that's like how, you know, we became yeah, you trusted him. business partners. Cause he's like, you like your rehab estimates were actually right. Like your ARVs were right. Like you were reasonable. Like, like, so it's one of those things where on both sides, I think we had trust experiences yeah. where it's like, he was like, man, I, this guy told me that if he feels like this wasn't right to just let him know. And then on my end, I'm like, this guy's really reasonable. And then, you know, I saw him that and then we end up doing a flip together and then realized we have very uh, complimentary skill sets. Yeah. He's good at the stuff that I'm horrible at. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a lot of fun and, but it's kind of crazy because it's like that one deal led to another deal, which led to a partnership. It's cool, man. And, you just never know where the stuff's going to go. Yeah. And that, I, honestly, that's like one of my favorite things about real estate is like you could meet someone, connect with them, not think anything of it. Six months down the road, they bring you a deal. Another three months down the road, they'll send any money on their deal. And then after that, you're like, man, we're doing a lot of deals together. This is pretty cool. Like the, yeah. it's so relationship based. And that's why you've brought up a point that I really want people to just like put into the core grain of everything they do. And it's to be honest and transparent in the deals you're buying and selling and to make sure that like you're putting your best self out there. Like you talk about wholesaling, right? Like it's not worth 
burning somebody and selling them a bad deal and lying to them about ARV and repairs and taking yep. photos that hide that to make five grand. Like it's not that hard to make five grand in this business, but if you have a bad reputation, it's going to be very hard to make five grand in this business. Yeah. But if no, you're right. And I think like what I've kind of found is like this, this community is fairly small. Like I didn't know you before today, but we had mutual friends and you can kind of like, you can see through stuff. You can see like who's doing stuff, who's not, who's, you know, like how are people approaching people? And that's like the people I want to be around. Like, well, you make money, you do well, but like you care about people. Like you actually treat people right. And that's like a lot of just kind of the focus of like everything like I'm doing and we're building is like, Hey, we approach everything. Like we're going to be in this business for the next I don't know, 50, however many years. Right. So like, could we squeeze money out of someone and like renegotiate and like do this stuff you see people teaching or doing or whatever? Yes, but it's never worth it. Nope. Like, um, you know, la last week I, or a few weeks ago, a guy told me he wanted like 45 grand for his house. And we came back and we're like, Hey, we're going to pay you 60. Cause like, that's what it's worth. Like, and we could have paid more, like, but that's like the right thing to do. And you know, I could have beat him up, got it for less and it would have been fine. Like, but you know, I, everything I try to do is approaching things of like, Hey, I want people to have a good experience. I want like them to tell their friends about us right. if in that situation or, you know, these people are in Austin. I don't know if I'll ever see them again, but you know, if they have someone like, you know, we want them to have that kind of like warm, fuzzy feeling. Absolutely, man. Well, like so. let's relate it back to the, the to the wholesale deal you gave. This you originally offered like 150 to 160, right? And the seller said he wanted uh, in, the, in the 200 range. Yeah, you went over what you could afford to pay, which I, you didn't do it because you know you're just trying to be nice. Like you could, you saw an ability to make yeah. the deal work, but you tried your best to make it work for the seller as well. And at 165, he felt like you took care of him, and because of that, you closed another deal. Versus yeah. the other way around. Imagine if you're just trying to squeeze them and you're like, not 155 or I walk. I'm sorry, I got to pull my offer off the table today. Uh, you know, it's it's $100,000 worth of repairs and your closing costs are 50 grand and I'm going to pay that for you. So yeah, it's 155 or nothing. You would have gotten an extra five grand out of them. Cool. Good job, Aaron. Because now you're not getting any referrals from him because he truly feels like you just beat him up in that negotiation. So you made an extra five, yeah. but you lost out on 40. Yeah. No, for sure. And that's one thing that's really cool that like, actually it was a conversation I had probably a month or so ago with uh, my escrow officer of the title company. She's like, what do you do different than everyone? Like your sellers yeah. are always nice and they're happy. That's like, so cool. You have the nice <laughs> sellers of like anyone we work with. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, or like, even like, we don't really have deals go sideways that much. Like we don't have people like, you know, sign something with us and try to go to someone else. Like, and I think it's, that's just kind of, do we probably leave money on the table or lose deals by, you know, not pushing people to sign in person, like on the spot, probably, but like, I just, I just would rather not do any of that stuff. Like uh, I'm not yeah. pushing, I tell people often like, Hey, list your house. Like we're an option. We're like trading in your car. Like, you know, you're giving up equity for convenience. Like, could you like clean it out and tune it up and list, you know, sell it yourself? Sure. We're not that we're not for everyone, but like, if you want to sell this way, you're going to have a good experience with us. And I think we're the best in town, what we do. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, but it's like, I'm not going to force a puzzle piece. that doesn't fit. If like, you know, by talking to me, you realize, Oh, we do want to clean that and list it or mm -hmm. want to keep it as a rental or, you know, whatever that option ends up being where it's like, you know, I enter into these situations of, we're just here to help. This is what we do. This is how we can be a resource. Like we're not pushy. I mean, yes, I am saying things and doing things that are, they're going to let their guard down. They're going to trust me more and want to work with me. Um, but it's not in a like salesy, right. Pressury like way. Like, Nobody wants to work with somebody like that. Like they want to exactly. know that they can trust you. And I think Jimmy Rex had done a, a video talking about how, he would always beat this guy out. They would always show up to the same. They were real, realtors at the time, but he'd always beat this one realtor out and he'd see him at all his appointments. And one day uh, the guy goes, Jimmy, how do you always, how do you always beat me? And yeah. you know, it's like ultimately what it came down to is the other guy would go in and say, well, you know what? Jimmy sucks and you shouldn't use him and I'm better and you should definitely use me. And, it's, and how I would relate that is you go in and you say, 
you didn't go in and say, hey, listing your house would be a terrible idea. That would be the dumbest thing you can do. Don't do that. Do, do this instead. And what Jimmy would do is he'd go in and he'd say, hey, look, you're actually, you're actually really lucky because this other guy, he's, he's good at what he does. Um, and so am I. So you really can't go wrong with choosing either one of us. Like you're, you're lucky yeah. that you have these options. Um, I'm a little bit better, in my opinion, at what I do. And this is why. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're going in and saying, no, I, you can list your house. Um, but if you go this route, I'm, I'm probably yeah. the best option. And this is why. Yeah. Well, and it's, so we, I mean, we compete on a lot of stuff. I mean, you never know how many people they're calling and, and whatnot, but, um, and I, and I tell people like all the time, like, Hey, probably not going to be your highest offer, but I also, I, I don't need an option period. We're going to put down earnest money. Mm-hmm. that's not fundable. Like we're not going to play games with you. Right. And like, Oh, here's a snapshot of my bank account where you see, I can buy it. Yeah. Like, you know, all these things where, um, but a lot of that's like, yes, we lose deals, but it's, it's never, I mean, I can't say never, it's rarely on price. So it's right. like, Hey, if at the end of the day you want $6 more and you want to go here, like, and you never know if you're going to get it or not. Like I get it. That's fine. Like it's, it's never going to work, but like, as long as like, you know, there's anything else involved, like we're going to get most of it. Right. Yeah. Well, dude, this has been a, you really know, fun show. It's been fun to talk about. Hold, oh, I think it, I think I lost you. Hold on. We'll cut that. Um, okay. The last thing I heard you say was, uh, we, we, we're not going to get all of them or something along those lines. Gotcha. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all the, we don't get all these deals, but you know, we rarely lose out on something other than price. Right. Right. If we're the same price, they like us, they trust us. They've seen our track record. You know, I can give them proof of funds. I'm not doing option periods. I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't need the house again. So we rarely lose out, you know, on, on other things. I mm-hmm. mean, there's times I've, I've missed stuff and I beat myself up on it. Cause it's like, you know, there's lots of times where you're like, what else do you have to have figure out in order to sell this? Like you need somewhere to go. Do you need movers? Do you need, you know, some of that stuff? And, you know, if you miss some of those details, you know, you miss deals, but it's, it's rarely just a price thing. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's important for people to remember um, that it's not always about the number. It's about how you make yeah. someone feel and how can you really assist them in, in transitioning out of something that's a problem and, and getting for away sure. from that problem. But dude, this has been a fun show, man. Um, I want to, before we run out of time, I've got a couple of questions that we always like to ask the, uh, awesome. the, the, the guest at the end of the show. So if you lost it all today, so you lost all your rentals, you lost all your money, you had nothing but your cell phone and a computer. What would you do to build your business back? Oh gosh. Um, if I lost it all today, where would I start? Yeah, right? like I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess like the, uh, what I would want to do is, you know, more expensive marketing options. But if, uh, I lost it all and needed deals and money, I guess I would, uh, I'd probably be driving for dollars you know, pull on some lists and cold calling and texting. Cause as much as I don't really enjoy that, it's probably the most cost effective way to, you know, get started and do a deal. And from there, I'd probably wholesale some stuff to get some money and then eventually get this thing rolling again. Yeah. I like it, man. That was very clear. I um, appreciate you sharing that. So what, uh, next question, what's your idea of chasing freedom? That's yeah, great question. So I guess my thing is the idea of chasing freedoms. I want to be at the point where it's like, if I want to just like phone it in one day and never do this again, I can't. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews in Ohio where my family is. So, you know, big thing this year is like, I want to go home more. So like, yeah. you know, I brought on a business partner and part of that's like, I can be gone more. Like, so for me, it's just, I guess the idea of, I don't think I'll ever stop doing this because it's fun. It's, it's yeah. fun. I love, I love the game. Yep. Like the idea of like waking up one day and not having to, or, you know, being able to like deal with like, I don't know, random financial hardships, you know, get my car towed for $250 randomly and it just being fine, you know, just things like that where uh, I think the biggest thing is just being able to one day just be like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's the choices, man. Like we don't want to be limited by choices. I, like that's why I get up and push so hard is, um, exactly. one day I, I don't want my choices to be limited by finances. 
Like if I want to go buy a yeah. house and I like it, I'm like, nope, I'm going to buy that house. I don't have to think yeah. about it, you know? So, um, sure. okay. So, uh, last one, what do you wish people understood more about real estate? As far as like getting into it or getting started or whatever, like, what do you, what do you wish that like more people were like, Oh, I get it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, the thing that I wish people realized more is that like, it's very accessible. Like it's really easy to, you know, buy a second house. Like you've lived in it, you can get a loan with 5% down. And then, um, so I think there's people see, you know, people in different stages and, you know, I know people that I'm like, Oh man, they're like, they're buying apartments. They're buying things I could never buy. And then, you know, there's, I was talking to a buddy and he has like three or four rentals the other day. And he was like, man, I just see you buying all these houses and I can never do that. And I'm like, dude, three years ago, I bought three houses and or we should buy over hundred this year. So I think it's, it's easy to get in. It's accessible. And even like the, just the cumulative effects of like, Hey, I buy a rental or a new primary every two to three years, like in five, 10, 15 years, that looks crazy different when you factor in, you know, it's paying down principal, you're getting a rent, you're getting appreciation. Um, and that's easy. Like, yeah, you can go all in, but you can also, Hey, just buy a house every now and then. Like, and you're going to experience the effects of, yeah. of this and maybe get addicted and you're crazy like us and mm-hmm. like it all the time. Or maybe it's just, you don't really like that, but it it's a nice little investment. Absolutely, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for taking your time to come to come uh, on the show. We, I really appreciate it, brother. Um, if people want to reach out to you and get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to, to contact you? Uh, probably the best is my Instagram, which is um, my last name, uh, Bealster1. Uh, or, I mean, you probably search Aaron Beal, and I'm probably the only one. Mm-hmm. So should be fairly easy to find. But uh, that's where I'm probably most interactive. Okay. And, you know, we'll probably respond to you. Okay. Sounds good, man. Well, uh, we'll throw that in the show notes for anyone that wants to get a hold of you. And again, thanks for coming on. We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode, you guys. Um, For more awesome real estate content, you can check out my Instagram. It's just Noah Evans underscore real estate. It'll also be in the show notes. If you want to reach out to the guest, their contact information and websites and however else to get a hold of them will also be in the show notes. All of our podcast episodes get thrown up to YouTube. And for more awesome uh, exclusive content, please go check out the website. Um, We'll have that link in the show notes below as well. All right. Peace.